Hey, it's Jordan. We'll open up the Chill Factory in about 20 seconds. Do you have the Chill Factory app yet? It's a great way to relax right now and forever. And at the end of this episode, I'll be giving a special password so that you and 25 other listeners can use all of the Chill Factory app's features for free. The leader regains that sense of, wait a second, I have some control not only on my own stress level, but I actually have influence on how my team members feel. Welcome to The Chill Factory, where we make work, school, relationships, and life less stressful. I'm Jordan Friedman. What comes to mind when you think of a cheerleader? For me, it's pom-poms and lots of spirit, and I hear chants like, Go Team Go! One of my favorite parts of my job is teaching teachers and coaches and really anyone who will listen how to be chill leaders, how to encourage and teach others how to use stress and anxiety reduction techniques. I believe that everyone can and should be a chill leader or a stress coach because It supersizes the number of people who will have stress and anxiety reduction techniques to use when they need them. And let's face it, it's just helpful to have a partner or a coach or someone there to help us de-stress. I also see a coach standing next to these cheerleaders, someone who works with other coaches and individual players and the team to help them more successfully reach their goals. When it comes to leadership and chill leadership in business, a coach extraordinaire is Ora Stuhl, and she's with me in the Chill Factory today to talk about why and how to be a chill leader. If you're a leader right now or you aspire to be one in your workplace or your community or even in your family, this conversation is like a playbook for how not only to be a chill leader, but how to be a super chill leader. Ora is a leading executive coach, and she's helped the most senior leaders to thrive, manage change, and get promoted in companies such as Pfizer, American Express, and LinkedIn. She's also a sought-after supervisor of other coaches who want to tap into her 25 years of executive coaching experience. Ora is the author of The Glass Elevator, a guide to leadership presence for women on the rise, and Stand Out, Boost Your Personal Brand. She's also the co-founder of CareerBlast.tv, a personal branding platform for professionals who want to stand out and succeed. Ora, how would you define leadership? Leadership is a big word. Now, as you know, tomes have been written about what is leadership, what a leader is. I say a leader focuses not only on themselves, but also focuses on others. So in the workplace, that involves focusing on things like productivity, both individual and collective team productivity. It also means tending to other humans in the workplace, tending to their needs. And their needs range from professional development to TLC, tender loving care. So I take it from that last part that you would agree that leadership requires being aware of the stress levels of the people around you, incentivizing your teams, your students, your audiences to focus on their wellness and do things to reduce their stress, to provide ways for them to do that. And the list goes on, of course, but let me just make sure you're, you're in agreement with that. Okay. I know you use the word chill, and I happen um, to love that word. If chill means being intentional about your own choices and also present and flexible for others, then yes. Uh, We have this notion that if we put on our own oxygen mask first, we'll be much better at helping others manage their masks. But having said that, I believe that a leader, an empathetic leader who cares about stress doesn't just mandate something because it works for them personally. An empathetic leader recognizes that every human is in a different place in life. So how you get your stress reduction, how you get your fix of oxygen might be quite different than how others get theirs. 
You know, it also speaks to learning from each other, whatever our positions are in a workplace or a school or wherever. There's a lot of learning to be had here. But hold that thought for a moment because I want to bring the voices of some who are listening and some who I've talked to in my experience in this field who will say, listen, leave your personal life at the front door of the office or now leave your personal life on a shelf before you log on to a meeting. Because work is work and our personal lives are our personal lives and let's yeah. just get on. So how do you, in your vast experience um, with this kind of work and working with leaders and working with companies, how would you respond to that pushback, if you will? Well, you know, sometimes my clients will say to me, like, I know this isn't personal and I'll stop them right there. And I'll say, of, of course, it's personal because you're experiencing it emotionally. Uh, so this notion about leaving your personal life at the office door is impossible for human beings who are inherently emotional human beings. Um, so let's talk what I call BC first, before COVID. So there was never any such thing BC as checking your human at the door. We're inherently emotional beings. And what we're doing every minute of the day is managing, juggling, balancing, integrating all the messy parts of our lives into our work day. So when you open your laptop to start work, you can't forget about, let's say, your sick child. You can't forget about your ailing parent, financial stress, the leak in the basement, anxiety about Ukraine, right? When you go to a meeting, you, of course, you're thinking about your need to call the plumber about that leak. Maybe you need to call your kid's teacher, even a divorce attorney. We are fully at work. And what I mean by fully is we're fully at work in the sense of being present with our full humanity. How can we check part of ourselves at the door? So now let me talk a little bit about COVID, um, the COVID era. To count one of COVID's very few blessings, um, COVID has actually forced us to see people in, in an authentic light, in their full humanity. How has it done that? Because we're looking into each other's homes. On that Zoom screen, we see kids, we see pets, we experience stresses and worries through that screen. Uh, what that has done for us is challenge us to be more aware of others' needs and to be empathetic to them. Uh, I remember in the early days of COVID, one leader who I was coaching said that she saw on Zoom that her direct report didn't have a desk. He was sitting on his couch juggling his laptop. And so what she did is she sent him a desk and a chair. Hmm. Uh, so we never check our full selves. We see each other fully. And we sometimes hear sirens in the background. <laughs> Absolutely. In my new office, a.k.a. the second bedroom of my home, you will hear the number one train and you will hear sirens in the background and, uh, and all the other wonderful noises of New York. Yeah. You know, in hearing the sirens and in hearing what you're saying, it's it's almost like the way we're doing this now, including understanding that people do have personal lives and they bring those personal lives to work and we're forced to see and hear that more and more now because of the way we are working with and post-COVID. It's more real life. This is life. Yeah. Showing up authentically also helps us build trust at work. People want to feel that their leaders are showing up authentically. They want to feel their genuine care for them. And when they do, then a relationship of trust develops. Yeah, an understanding of the person who supervises me or the person who I follow understands some of the same things that I'm dealing with and makes it more comfortable for me to raise concerns that I might have. Yeah, absolutely. You know... People always ask me what I do as an executive coach and companies hire me to help them 
retain their leaders, to help them promote their leaders by working on some aspect of their leadership. They want to see these leaders thriving. But what I say that I do is I help people feel much happier when the alarm goes off super early on a Monday morning. And why is that important? Because when they feel happier, they have this immediate ripple effect on everyone around them. Everyone around them feels happier. And from a corporate perspective, that does translate into motivation. That does translate into productivity, which is what they're looking for. Yeah, there's such a thing as stress contagion when someone is really stressed and exhibiting stressful behavior that can trigger the stress response for those around that person. And the opposite Mm -hmm. is true and is really what you're saying. When people feel happier and calmer, uh, that can be contagious for others around them. It's two sides of a coin. So the other side of the coin is if your leader, if your employee wakes up early Monday morning and feeling stressed, that has that contagious ripple effect on everyone around them. And that negatively affects productivity and feeling in the workplace. Absolutely. And I think, too, that there is a difference or there can be a difference between a leader who exhibits some of the behaviors that you've talked about, who walks the talk of being mindful and meditating and taking a gym break. And there can be a difference between all of that good stuff and a company that has policies that don't support that kind of thing. And I'm wondering if you can comment on that or or have you experienced that and are there resolutions for for that issue? Yeah. Um, I often see that leaders sometimes start with this notion that they have no control, that they're operating in a toxic culture. Uh, So there's nothing they can do. to influence people. Uh, You can chip away at that a little bit. If you are in a position of leadership, you actually have more control than you know. And if there are certain behaviors that are upsetting you in the workplace, for sure they're affecting others negatively as well. So for instance, if you're stressed out as a leader from being pinged all day from all the technology that is supposed to support our project management, from Microsoft Teams, from Slack, from text messages, from emails. You are so distracted and so stressed out about the demands being placed on you. And the first reaction to that was, what can I do? This is my environment. You can bet that everyone else is suffering from the same thing. And as a leader, there is opportunity to have that conversation with your team. What is working for us? What is not working for us? Bring sense of self to that conversation. Here's what I'm experiencing from this constant availability 24-7. I'm wondering if anyone else is feeling this. What changes can we talk about that might reduce that pressure, that stress that we all feel by from being compelled to answer all these pings and dings and alerts all day long? And I think the conversation opens up opportunity. The leader regains that sense of, wait a second, I have some control not only on my own stress level, but I actually have influence on how my team members feel. So, Ora, hopefully we have motivated listeners to think about this idea of chill leadership. And hopefully we have... Uh, some pom-poms going out there and we have people saying, yeah, I want to I wanna be a chill leader. I want to help people reduce their stress. I want to support people's mental health in a stronger, more actionable way. What would be some of the key steps, the key actions that you would suggest they take to make that happen? So first, start with yourself. Ask yourself these four questions. Number one, what are my non-negotiables that will help me reduce my stress and be more present, 
more chill. For some people, that's exercise in the morning or meditation. For other people, that's just having breaks between meetings, having time for lunch, or having that opportunity to be home with family for dinner. Question number two is, what are my activity priorities? And what goal do I have that I'm not accomplishing? Uh, for some leaders, they're so busy in the day-to-day -day tactical problem solving that they're not making time to plan strategically for what's next. Question number three is, what's getting in the way? What workplace challenges are getting in my way? If they're getting in your way, they're likely getting in other people's way as well. And question number four is, all right, which of these things do I have control over and which don't I? Typically, we all have more control than we think. Now, once you ask yourself these four questions, they're perfect questions to ask your team members. So what's gonna help you feel more chill, less stress? Number one, what are your priorities? What are you upset that you're not accomplishing? Uh, what's getting in the way of you doing what you wanna do? And where do you have control over managing these things? Where can I help you? Where can the team change some of their habits so it works for you? So that's what I think is super chill leadership. Why? Because it focuses on yourself as a leader, but it also focuses on others, on the people that you lead. These questions help you get your oxygen and they also help you help others get their oxygen. Yeah, I love the 360 part of this. Mm. So before over, you mentioned the leader or supervisor who sent a desk and chair to someone on their team because they saw through Zoom or some other kind of video meeting that that was missing for them. In your experience, are there any chill leader stories that jump out to you that make you cheer and think, wow, yes, we need more of this we need leaders to do more of this. Mm. Well, I'll, I'll share a story that uh, a leader that I coached shared with me uh, yesterday. Uh, she's going undergoing a lot of stress um, because her, her two boys are having some challenges in school. And the school called her one morning and uh, asked her to come in. And uh, she almost fell apart. She's pulling on clothes and she gets into her car and she's driving. And then what does she hear? A siren behind her. A cop stops her. And they start having this conversation. And she, she notes that she's hardly wearing pants, which the cop seems to notice. But then she says, the cop says to her, lady, you need to slow down. And she said it was an incredible wake-up call for her, the way he said it to her, and she just started laughing. Uh, but sometimes we all just need that, that singular wake-up call to make us begin to focus on ourselves. That's a great story. We can have our eyes on the road, right, both for ourselves and for others in this way. Yeah. Overstuhl, thanks so much for coming by the Chill Factory today and not only shining a spotlight on leadership and what it means to be a strong leader, but on what it means and how to become a chill leader during times when we all need more chill leading. Learn more about Ora and her work in the episode notes. Ever heard of binaural beats? They are two different sound frequencies that the brain turns into one. This new sound slows more active brain waves, lessens stress and anxiety, and even reduces the perception of pain according to some studies. Now we can't actually hear these binaural beats, but their benefits can be increased by listening to them through headphones or earbuds. So if you'd like, grab a pair because I'm about to play a short piece of sound or music that contains binaural beats to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about and to see if they help you feel calmer.
What do you think? That's from a track called Ebb, which is on the Chill Factory app. The entire track is about nine minutes, and it may take longer than the short time we listen to it for you to realize the calming benefits of binaural beats. But the good news is you have access to all of the Chill Factory app's features and relaxation techniques, including this one in the Sonic Spa. Just download the Chill Factory app from the App Store or Google Play, and when prompted, enter the password LEADER so that you and 24 others can use all of the Chill Factory app's features for one year for free from the original post date of this episode. Here's a quick update on an initiative we launched a couple of weeks ago. The war in Ukraine continues, and so does our effort to help bring a little peace to Ukrainians and refugees and volunteers helping them. We at The Stress Coach, which produces the Chill Factory podcast, are donating tens of thousands of our products to help these groups deal with the stress and anxiety and trauma of the unthinkable events in Ukraine. We asked you and other audiences to contribute to this special effort by either donating funds or getting the word out about it so that we can customize the content of these products to better meet the needs of Ukrainians and refugees. For example, we have already started to translate the content into Ukrainian and Polish, thanks to the support we've received so far. If you'd like to join in and help out, just go to fundraiser, that's F-U-N-D-R-A-Z-R dot com slash calm for Ukraine. And you can read all about this initiative there. You can also find it in the episode notes. And thanks to everyone who's helped so far to bring a little bit of peace to those who so desperately need it. It's quitting time for this episode of The Chill Factory. I'm Jordan Friedman. Thanks so much for listening. We have more resources at thechillfactory.net, and you can leave a voice comment or question there. Just look for the blue tab on the right side of any site page. Be sure to subscribe or follow The Chill Factory so you'll know when new episodes are available. And if you liked something you heard on this or any episode, we'd love it if you rated or reviewed The Chill Factory wherever you get your podcasts. And as German poet, author, and scientist Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, correction does much, but encouragement does more.